University where she was recently a Stettner Fellow. Her stories have been published in the Paris Review yeah. and the New England Review. Please welcome Sarah. Woo! So I'm going to read from my, my Paris Review story actually just came out, so I'm going to read um, a couple excerpts from it. Uh, it's 31 pages long, so I chose two small scenes smack dab in the middle. Um, so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of context and hopefully it'll make sense. Um, so the story is called Housebreaking. Uh, the main character's name is Seamus. He's in his late 20s. He's a Christian scientist who recently lost his faith um, and he's also unemployed. And he's just started a relationship with a woman named Charity, um, and it's moving very quickly. Uh, they decided she'll move in, into his house. So uh, Charity works in, and he, they live in, he lives in Wheaton, Maryland, and she lives in, uh, she was living in Arlington. And she works in Washington, D.C. in public relations for lots of big, sketchy companies, which are named in the story, but I won't name here. Um, and she's also just getting out of a 10-year relationship uh, with a man named Greg, and has, uh, and Greg manages a Verizon store and breaks into houses for a living on the side. And, and she was living with him and his mother in a house in Arlington. So at this point in the story, Seamus is driving Charity to Greg's house to get her stuff so she can move in with him. So that's the first scene I'm going to read. Uh, a few weeks later, they drove to Arlington to pick up Charity's things. It was early evening. The rush hour traffic was slow, th slow through the city and stopped altogether on the bridge. Charity sat in a passenger seat, snapping the door handle as if she might jump out at any moment. <coughs> Stop, Sheena said. Sorry, I'm just not looking forward to dealing with Greg. Then, as if saying his name had rattled something loose inside, she started listing off details about her ex. He didn't drink milk because it was a quarter pus. At one time, he'd owned a pet ferret, but abandoned it outside animal control because the smell bothered his mother. He talked constantly about climate change and had once woken Charity in the middle of the night to tell her humans were causing the end of the 11,000-year-old, environmentally stable Holocene epoch and that Earth's climate had already crossed three of the nine thresholds between now and a planet that couldn't sustain wide, widespread human civilization. They're like the nine rings of hell, he said, except interlocking so you don't know when the whole chain will come clattering down. She said she didn't want to discuss climate change right then, and he accused her of reckless blindering, which she didn't think was a word. He said she'd, she'd see what he meant in a couple decades when the super-rich bought up what was left of an inhabitable land while everyone else died of extreme weather, starvation, war, and disease. Charity told Seamus how, for her birthday, Greg had driven her to an alley in Georgetown in the night, where he had scaled a fence, opened a gate for her, and led her through a backyard to a fancy old house. She was thinking there must be some kind of surprise party when he kicked down the back door. I was stunned, she said. I just followed him around the house while he bagged things. You know, emptied out the woman's jewelry box. I was scared we'd get caught and pissed at Greg for putting me in that situation. I kept asking him about the alarm. What if we'd triggered a silent alarm? Later I found out he had a friend at the company. He wanted to scare you? But I wasn't scared, she said. It was weird. I didn't feel that bad either. It was this huge, spotless house and it felt good watching him fuck it up. You know they had someone waiting on them, cleaning their house every day, doing their laundry, managing their money, making their food. You know nobody in that house was working the night shift while her seven-year-old put herself to bed. And you know what? Their money's probably just as dirty as Greg's. Maybe legal, but dirty. There's a lot of that in this city. I see it all the time. If you've got enough money, you just rig the system so you don't have to break any laws. Seamus said that watching people screw each other to get rich made it hard for him to believe in a loving, all-powerful God. Either there's a powerful God who doesn't love us, he said, or a loving God who has no control. Or no God, Charity said. Right, said Seamus, or that. Greg lived in a two-story house with a porch swing and eaves and flowering bushes around the windows. It was not what Seamus had pictured. There's not much to carry, Charity said. I put most of my stuff in storage. Then she asked Seamus to wait in the car. He watched her walk up the front steps, take out a key, and let herself into the house. Then he put his seat back and closed his eyes. The night was warm and still, the smell of magnolia drifting through the window. Hey, somebody said, near his left ear. He opened his eyes and found a head a few inches from his own, all curly black beard and hair and a round, pale face. Are you the guy my wife's leaving, for, leaving me for, Greg said. Under all the hair, he looked young and slight, his slender wrists resting on the door, crossed like the paws of a cat. She didn't tell you? Of course she didn't tell you. You're Greg? Welcome to my world, Greg said. Seamus could smell the dinner on his breath, beef and onions. How tall are you, Greg asked. Six five. 
What do you do for a living? I'm unemployed, Seamus said. Greg snorted. Go figure, she's always looking for a big fucking project. The screen door banged and Charity came out of the house, a trash bag in each hand. Seamus pushed, pushed the door open, forcing Greg to step back. He walked over to Charity and took the bags from her. You okay, he said. She nodded, her face tight. He put the bags in the trunk, trying hard not to feel as if he'd stumbled onto the set of somebody else's life, somebody else's marriage. Greg followed Charity around to her side of the car, but she climbed in, locking the door. Seamus got in too and started the car, but Greg ran back around to the driver's side and stuck his head in the window. Hold on, he said, sounding so miserable that Seamus was tempted to turn off the ignition and say, let's talk about this. It's hard, but it doesn't have to be this hard. But Charity had grabbed Seamus and was digging her finger into his elbow. He put the car in neutral and let it roll. Greg jumped back and Seamus slid into gear. And Seamus slid into gear. They drove in silence until they reached the dark, empty parkway. I'm sorry about that, Charity said. We were common in law. I, we were common law. I divorced him a year ago, and he knows it. What does divorcing a common law involve? Nothing, she said. We don't have any shared assets. Then she started to cry. Okay, so the second section I'm going to read actually comes before this section in the story, but um, it's a flashback. Hold on. And it's uh, the year before. It's when Seamus is losing his faith. Um, and at that point, he was uh, working for a human rights organization, and he was invited to travel in western Pakistan to uh, document the civilian casualties for drone attacks. Um, so he's, a video he's traveling as a videographer, and he's traveling with a much more experienced human rights worker whose name is Melinda, who's in her 50s, um, and she intimidates him pretty badly. Uh, and, then, and then the other thing you probably need to know is that at this point in the trip that we're going to read, he's already given up on trying to heal fungal infection. Um, through prayer, so it's actually <laughs> athlete's foot, but, um, but so he gave up on it, and he's uh, taken an oral antifungal, which is the first medicine he's ever taken in his life, because he's a, he was a practicing Christian scientist, so he's only taken ibuprofen outside that, so he's already kind of starting to lose his faith at this point. So this is taking pl place in North Waziristan in the travel areas of Pakistan, and they're traveling illegally with guides and a translator. Um, sorry, I have to find a page. Melinda wore a headscarf inside the homes, but on the road she was in full burqa, which seemed to make her more silent than usual, so that Seamus sometimes felt as if he were riding beside a bird in a cage that somebody had thrown a sheet over. He was relieved not to have to watch her watching him while he chatted with the other men, but he was also ashamed of that relief. He was always grateful to escape when the car stopped, to be away from her silence and the blue mesh of her veil, to stretch his cramped legs and spit the dust from his mouth. The men would go off in search of directions or food, one of them always sta uh, staying behind, leaning against the car with the rifle while he talked to Seamus. But Melinda rarely left the back seat, a blue tent of a figure that could have been anyone. They saw their first casualties in Marancha, where the group toured a hospital room packed tight with cots of wounded men and children. Seamus had been given permission to film, and he walked around the room with the camera, grateful because he couldn't imagine what else to do with his hands and his eyes. He filmed a man who had watched his wife die with their child in her arms, another who had lost both legs. He filmed child after child, covered in bandages, unconscious in their cots or staring into his camera with wide, impassive eyes. Afterwards, they found a man who identified himself as a Pashtun freedom fighter and agreed to be filmed if he could wear a scarf over his face. And the translator stood at Seamus' elbow, speaking into the camera. They murder us down to the youngest child, if they see Pashtun in a Toyota car, they call them Taliban or spy. They call airstrikes onto the vehicle with innocent people in it. By they, he said, he meant the American and Punjabi devils. Seamus felt the first twinge of a headache right after they had left the hospital and it built throughout the afternoon. By evening, it was jackhammering at his left eye and his stomach rolled in his gut. Back at the house where they were staying, he threw up in a bucket and lay down on his mattress. He tried to say a few words of prayer, but couldn't make sense of them, as if he were reciting a song in a language he had forgotten. He drifted off into a half-sleep and dreamt briefly that he was in the hollowed-out hollowed bone of a dead thing, where a shape he couldn't identify moved in the shadows. He had a word to describe the shape, but even dreaming, he didn't know what that word meant, and when he awoke, it was gone. The human rights, rights workers were sitting on the bed next to him, speaking in Pashtu. Soon they got up and left. He dozed off again. The next time he woke up, he found Melinda sitting on the edge of his bed, holding a glass of water. You're not supposed to be in here, he said. She shrugged. I thought maybe you weren't drinking enough. You weren't drinking enough, she said coolly. It could be altitude sickness. 
He sat up and took the glass from her. Thanks, I'll be okay. She was watching him and he could tell something was bothering her. After what felt like three full minutes of silence, she asked, did you notice how few women were in the hospital today? He nodded. I asked one of the guides about it. He said it was becoming difficult to find female doctors to work in the region, and many female patients didn't come in because it was shameful for them to be touched by male doctors. He used that word, she said, shameful. But what if they're dying? Seamus, have you ever thought about why two guys with Kalashnikovs offered to show us around Wazir Stan? Are you saying they're not human rights workers? I'm not sure it's that simple. The ever-present film of dust was thicker now, coating his teeth and tongue. If we can't really know, he said, then what's all this for? She stared at him, her expression unreadable. You seem really shook up, she said. His ears burned, and he put the glass to his mouth and drank. Thanks. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, we have um, Paul Carmen Roberts. Yeah.